This is like rock, paper, scissors, but a slightly more complicated Catholic version. everybody welcome back to witch fix today we're looking at witch house one uh i still haven't seen witch house two it's in the post somewhere it'll get to me but we have already reviewed the third film in the series and i said that i get around to watching the first two um now normally in like, these straight to video movies the first one is kind of okay and then they go downhill from there and this is not the case with this trilogy i'm gonna call it because i actually kind of enjoyed witch house 3 it was a bit schlocky and weird and kind of dumb but i i i mostly enjoyed it this film on the other hand kind of bored me and that 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 wasn't great i think that's mostly to do with the fact that the plot is very similar to the house on haunted hill uh which came out i think in the same year 1999 uh the remake with jeffrey rush that is not like the original movie that it was based on but in that movie uh, a bunch of people are invited mysteriously to this house party in this old asylum that is now a mansion. And it turns out that they've all been invited because they were descended to the only people who survived the fire that claimed the original asylum. Uh, and they've been invited there because of spooky reasons of spook. And this film is pretty much the same idea it's a big house party where a bunch of people are invited by someone they barely know because of who they're related to um but also it's about witchcraft so we'll get into it notably this movie seems to be inspired by some parts of hp lovecraft so i thought i'd mention that right off the bat it takes place in dunwich massachusetts which is a fictional location from lovecraft's work although dunwich is also a real place in suffolk england so the more you learn and also there's a, a book that's named something similar to the necrocomicon so I, I just thought i'd mention that in that i guess due to the open source nature of quite a lot of lovecraftian horror this is canonical with his work which i think would annoy him and i'm okay with that so a car rocks up at this big old house that kind of didn't remind me of the house on haunted hill because it looks less like an actual house where someone would live and more like a cross between like the asylum and an observatory it's very kind of a narrow but tall building with a big kind of globey thing on the top it's it's a very weird shape it's very american but th these two people get out of the car this is bob and margaret which is the name that i give middle class people when i'm making fun of them bob and margaret are here for a party being thrown by elizabeth who was known to margaret in grade school but they haven't really spoken much since and she always thought elizabeth was a bit weird so naturally she's come to her party no one answers the door so they just let themselves in and start poking around. Uh, at this point, Margaret's not really that keen, but Bob seems to be excited to get into this creepy house, which is covered in lit candles because no one cares about fire safety. And he's just sort of poking around and they eventually decide to go down into the basement. The basement looks like every dungeon that was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's like fake rock walls and the ground is mysteriously just covered in sand. You know the ones where it's just like, ah, oh, this is the perfect area for someone to do some choreographed fighting. Uh, and there's also like torches all over the walls and candles everywhere. So it's creepy down there. Because it's so creepy, Bob just decides to bring up the fact that he's always wanted to do it in a graveyard. But this is sort of the same thing. Uh, and then proceeds to just start taking his shirt off. And Margaret's like, I know I was scared for my life a minute ago, but okay so they're kissing and then a mysterious figure comes out of the shadows and then its eyes glow green but it kind of looks like you know in cgi when they make someone's real eyes look like they're glowing this isn't that this is two green shapes being put onto a silhouette like fuzzy felts it's not that great uh then they get stabbed so bob gets stabbed first and then margaret gets the chance to scream before she is too stabbed and then we get the credits so this opening scene and the credits take nine minutes and the opening scene was not that long it's too many credits is what i'm saying uh, and the credits is a lot of creepy woodcuts some cgi evil weird rippling 
red colours and some little kind of JPEGs of pentacles that someone has done like flips and inverts on using what I'm guessing is some sort of proto era PowerPoint. But it was hilarious. We then cut back to the rest of the party guests who are still in the house. Unclear if they arrived before or after Bob and Margaret, but they didn't hear the scream apparently. And they take a while to actually introduce their names and when they do, they mumble. So it took me a while to work out who they were, but we've got Brad, who despite his name is a scientist and a bit of a nerd. We've got Scott and Maria, who are the jock and hot girl power couple for the movie. They look like they're in their 30s, but I think everyone here is meant to be college age. Then we've got Jack, who is an applied scientist. I don't know what that is, and the movie never tells us. And we're also introduced to Janet and Tony, who are a rock chick and a stoner, respectively. A word about Janet. Janet is far and away the worst actress in this movie. It was literally a painful every time she spoke. As, as her character, she's just like someone in a vinyl top who's kind of like Pauli Perret if she'd had 17 consecutive anvils to the head and had forgotten how to speak properly. Because every line that comes out of her mouth is overacted, sounds like she's chewing imaginary gum, and like she's in the fifth straight-to-video sequel to Clueless. Hey, Janet, maybe we should get out of here. Oh, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm a little bit scared about what's going on in here, if I'm telling you the truth. I was so glad when she died. Let's just leave it there. But we're introduced to all these people. Then Liz arrives. Liz is dressed in an old-fashioned costume dress and seems to be, you know, having a case of the Morticia Adamses. She pulls back a rug to reveal a pentacle on the floor, and it's clear that the party's about to get started. Tony the stoner does some stonery type conversations and everyone ignores him. And Scott decides that he kind of wants to get drunk and Maria's like, oh, I don't want you to get drunk. None of this matters because all these people are going to die. The doorbell rings and Liz goes to answer it because she's the consummate hostess. And in the meantime, Maria accuses Scott of flirting with Liz and then he convinces her to go upstairs for some fun private alone time like college kids do. Maria also says that when they were kids, people used to say that uh, Elizabeth's house was haunted. So I guess she's the one of this couple who knows Elizabeth. Neither confirmed nor denied. Like, we, we don't really hear about how any of these people are meant to know Elizabeth or which parts of which couples are meant to know her. But take that for what it's worth. This house is meant to be haunted. This is like 20 minutes into the movie by this point. Not a huge amount has happened except for slowly introducing these characters who are all basically stereotypes and didn't need much introducing. It's just a lot of painful dialogue while they just talk to each other and it's like, ah, oh, relationship, relationship, sass, sass, sass. And then Janet will say something and it'll take me a minute to regain the power of hearing. Jack finds a book, which is the Necronomicon, which is, I guess, the sequel to the Necronomicon. Uh, and he wonders what it is, but doesn't, like, look at it to work out what it is. Liz then returns with another girl called Jennifer, who is doing the she's all that thing of, like, she's wearing glasses, so don't be fooled by her otherwise conventional attractiveness. Jack then recognises Jennifer from being in his psychology class last year, and they have a little nerd flirt off together. Scott and Maria go upstairs to, you know get it on and when they get into the room Marie is just like oh wow should we sit on this stuff or contact a museum because the furniture's old uh, and also the only thing that I could really see is just a sofa covered in blankets and a bed and it's like none of these things look like antique because you can't really see them they're all under like frozen blankets and stuff mildly annoying there's also this like lightning, like crash of lightning and flickering light, but it happens every 30 seconds and it makes the dialogue really hard to understand. So like this is the worst thunderstorm that I've ever seen in a movie, uh, both in terms of its ferocity and the, the, the effect being put into it, because it's just like crash, 30 seconds, crash, Janet speaks, no crash, why? I'm ragging on Janet a lot, but this is just a terrible performance. Uh, anyway, downstairs, everyone who isn't currently upstairs having sex, Gets around the pentacle, even Brad, who takes a minute to be convinced, because he's a scientist. They get a little talk from Elizabeth about how today is May Day, a day of a special full moon and something to do with the stars being closer to Earth, which, I mean, the physicist didn't say anything about this, but I was just like, what? She also says that this day, May Day, coincides with bad events like Pompeii, the invention of the atomic bomb and the Black Plague. I don't know why they picked Mayday, because Mayday is like Beltane. 
So if you want to do like dark, creepy shit, usually people pick Samhain, like Halloween. It's built in. There are already jack-o'-lanterns all over this house. Why couldn't they just say Halloween? Why do they have to be different? Because May Day is like maypoles, children dancing around maypoles, flower crowns. It's basically Coachella. It's not scary. And the movie tries to make it scary, but it doesn't really succeed. They should have just picked the blood moon. Every other movie I've seen recently goes with the blood moon because it sounds creepy. Anywho, she then says that she's going to tell a story and that it's part of her story because it involves her bloodline. And that 300 years ago, on this very night, in a house just like this house, in a town just like this town, her ancestor, Lilith Le Fay, was killed for being a witch. So, it's pretty important. And we find out that Lilith's parents were sorcerers and black magicians. Hold that idea in your mind. I'm going to call back to it in a moment. But that they taught their daughter black magic and she soon surpassed them in her powers. And then she began to go beyond even what they were capable of. And I thought, oh shit, she was into some real dark magic then. And then, and then Elizabeth goes on to say that the things she was into that were, that were beyond the things that her parents were into, you know, the parents who studied black magic in Puritan times, were illicit sex, drinking, dancing in a graveyard, and blasphemy. Which are definitely things that Puritans would consider bad. But her parents are already meant to be sorcerers, so you'd think they'd let her have a little bit of Malibu in the evenings. And maybe let her say, cool, blimey. So it, it makes no sense, this, this is part of the story. But then they say that she looked into her father's grimoire, which was forbidden because it was obviously his secret stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's what you should have led with. Not that she wasn't allowed to say Jesus. So there we go. Apparently this was a big no-no and the family were annoyed with her. And she retaliated by doing something that led to their sudden deaths. There we go. She then abducted a child on May Day uh, to sacrifice as a true innocent, but was stopped by witch hunters and then burnt at the stake. So, kind of a big day for her. She done fucked up. We then get a sort of like weird flashback. We see like some men holding torches. It, the film quality is super grainy, so I couldn't really tell what was happening. But when we cut back to like the action we see that brad the scientist is now tied to a cross and the others are surrounding him in cloaks talking in old timey terms and they call him lilith and then they say they're going to burn him and then liz rips off her own face and she's got like a bad mannequin corpse face underneath and then he wakes up in the circle and he's like oh that was a horrifying dream i need to leave immediately so Liz goes to call him a cab, except she's probably just calling Satan and telling him to get down here right now because shit's kicking off. Scott and Maria have now had sex and Scott has gone to sleep because he's tired. So um, she decides to go and have a shower and then she's going to stay in there for the next 30 minutes because so much stuff happens while she's in that shower. She must have been pruned to hell by the time they actually remembered to do anything with Maria's character, but just remember from this point onwards, Maria's having a shower. Jack and Jennifer go exploring, which is code for flirting, but just in a different section of the house. And while Brad waits in the foyer downstairs, we see some sort of brightly coloured ghost orbs flying over his head, which are never seen or mentioned again. Uh, Jennifer then, because she's into history, tells Jack that the mansion they're in was moved stone by stone from France because like the Puritans, the Lafay family moved to America to escape religious persecution. But unlike the Puritans, they were Satanists. And apparently this is just well known. And she says that they're connected, obviously, to Morgan Lafay, uh, the family. And then Jack decides to give her a little bit of history knowledge. And he says that the wiring is in these like swags along the wall because the walls are made of stone and therefore they can't have modern wiring embedded in them. But because of the way water condenses on stone, this usually leads to like sh wires shorting out, power cuts, etc. And then he says, oh no, that's not interesting. And it's meant to be this moment where it's like, Jack, you're a nerd and you have no game. But honestly, this was the most interesting fact that I learned in this film, if it is a fact. But it was definitely interesting. And there we go. They then find another Lafay Necronomicon. 
Uh, and Jennifer says that it's probably like how families had a copy of the Bible for each member of the family. There are just loads of copies of this book. Hold on to that idea because the film doesn't. In the meantime, Brad gets sick of waiting for the cab that's never coming. He goes downstairs into the basement and finds Liz mid-invocation. The invocation is really well written and quite well acted. I enjoyed it. Um, then we get like a flash to more people holding torches, but they're wearing like S&M gear and doing this weird like horror film shaky face. But there we go. And then we see the outside of the house with really bad fake lightning. Like this might as well just be a white zigzag painted on some acetate and shaking in front of the camera. It looks dreadful. Mid invocation, Elizabeth holds up the severed heads of Bob and Margaret. You'd think that at this point, Brad would run, but he doesn't. Because physicists are dumb. Lilith then appears and she's got like the vampire face makeup on, like from, again, from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and like a big Queen of Hearts kind of collar on her old fashioned dress. And Lilith is like, ah, you've summoned me. Great. That's not a direct quote, but I can't remember what she actually says, but she's just pleased to be there. Uh, Lilith has a lot of reverb on her voice, so she's quite hard to understand. But she does Palpatine Force Lightning at Brad and kills him and says that this is revenge, which is an idea that we'll come back to later, and then tells Liz to go and claim her prize. It's never specified what this is or what Liz was meant to get out of this whole deal. But there we go. Meanwhile, looking in the Necronomicon, Jack discovers a list of names, which are like Goodman, Steve, etc. But he realises that all of their last names, like all of the guests' last names, are in this book as the witch hunters who killed Lilith. So that's why they've been invited to this party, for revenge. But Jennifer's last name is suspiciously absent. Um, and for some reason, she allows this to be a mystery right up until the end of the movie. But I don't know why she kept it a secret. Does she know she's in a movie? Don't know. They decide it seems really sketchy that all of them have a connection to this murdered witch and have been invited to this party by someone they barely know. So they decide to go and try and find Elizabeth or one of the others to work out what's going on. Meanwhile, a wobbly air effect, like a kind of gelatinous bit of oxygen, settles on a sleeping Scott and he sits up, now also with a vampire face, so I'm just going to say that he's been possessed. Maria is still in the shower, so she has got to be claimed by this point but she's approached by scott who like sees her silhouette through the curtain and then pulls aside the curtain and goes rah and she screams so there you go jack and jennifer don't hear the scream or i guess they do but they're too busy making soft eyes at each other in the corridor to notice downstairs tony and janet have an irritating argument about whether or not they heard a scream and if they did if it was real any scene that she's in is just hard to watch okay they decide that they want to leave but jack's their ride so they have to go and find him before they can leave but then as they're like going to look for jack janet says and it pains me to have to even recall the moments at which she spoke she says isn't it weird that all our names are in this book are you telling me that's just a coincidence but she wasn't there when they found this out because Jack and Jennifer were in a library or something in a completely different part of the house to where Tony and Janet were. They haven't met up with them since then to tell them. We haven't even seen Janet open a copy of the Necronomicon to find the names herself. She just magically has this knowledge because she got it by osmosis, I guess. Upstairs, while plinkety plonkety piano music plays, Jack takes Jennifer's glasses off and says her eyes look incredible because we're invested in this relationship. All the lights thankfully go out and Jack's like, curse that wiring. Um, but then they go and find the others because they're getting a little bit freaked out. Janet and Tony creep around while she holds her electric guitar like, I'm going to batter someone with this. They call out and then go into a room where like the blankets are moving around and they assume that it's Scott and Maria just unresponsive because they're having sex and they decide to go and try and find the others and then come back for them later. The moving around under the blankets is actually Maria and Scott, but they are monsters and just hiding there because it's not time for them to come out yet because of plot reasons. Janet and Tony then get cornered by Lilith in a corridor and she palpatines Tony to the ground and then Janet throws her guitar at her, which does nothing. What were you expecting it to do? And then Roundhouse kind of like, I don't know, does she kick her or punch her? She does a, a sort of punch, I guess, in, uh, sends Lilith into a different room and then just shuts the door. Then helps Tony up because somehow he survived the lightning that killed Brad. 
maybe he's just made of stern stuff. Anyway, they have a loud conversation just in the corridor instead of, you know, running away. And they decide to go and get Scott and Maria. So Tony gets sent to get Scott and Maria and Janet goes off to find the others. Liz finds Jack and Jennifer first, however, and they say that they're leaving. But she calls Lilith up, not on the phone. She, like, makes her appear and threatens them. So now they know it's all real. Uh, she claws Jennifer's arm. Jack then tries prayer, and it is not effective. So he's probably lost faith forever. They run away instead, and Liz says that the doors won't open until they get their revenge. So they're pretty much trapped in this house. Tony goes into the room where Scott and Maria are. And 10 seconds later, they pull his head off. And it has, like, where his, like, neck stump is, it has those, like, zigzaggy lines, like you, as a kid, draw on an Easter egg to show that it's open. Looks funny. Anywho, he does not survive this, uh, as he did the lightning, because apparently he has limits. Jack and Janet... Jack, Jennifer... No. Jack and Jennifer then meet Janet. This... This is too many names that begin with J. Tony's head is then rolls up them down the hallway, followed by Scott and Maria the zombies. So they run away. But unfortunately, they run right into Lilith and then into the basement of horrors. So out of the frying pan into the fire. They find the bodies of all of their friends and another copy of the Necron Numicon. Uh, they, and this is the point which I just didn't understand because Jack's like, oh, we should take this book with us. It's clearly important. We should take it with us and take it away. And it's like, but there's copies of it everywhere. You keep finding this book. If you take, why didn't you take any of the others? And why, if you take this one, do you think it will accomplish something? Janet then stands by some fire and turns into a Lilith monster, which does change her voice. So, hooray! Uh, she then is a bit threatening and Jack stabs her, but... She pulls the knife out and throws it into his leg. So, you know, hard pass. He then uses his tiny crucifix to deflect her Palpatine lightning, I guess, maybe. Because prayer and the crucifix wasn't effective against Lilith. But now the crucifix is effective against lightning. This is like rock, paper, scissors, but a slightly more complicated Catholic version. But anywho, the lightning gets reflected back at Janet by a shiny thing, which I think is either a mirror or a very shiny tray wielded by Jennifer, and she dies. So Jack and Jennifer are able to escape. They take the Necronomicon with them, which is stupid for reasons that I feel like I've already explained, because there's copies everywhere. Jack then says that they have to kill Elizabeth, and they're going to do it with the power of applied science. He gets a sword and has Jennifer use it to cut some power cables which are on the wall for reasons that have already been explained, which is kind of funny. Um, they then attach these to a fire poker, essentially making like an electrified harpoon. Uh, and then Lilith arrives. Not Elizabeth. They said they were going to kill Elizabeth, but they end up killing Lilith. Unsure why the change. But... Lilith arrives and he taunts her with the book, threatens to burn it. Again, there are thousands of this book, so I don't know why this works. But she chokes him. He then stabs her with the poker, signals to Jennifer, and she cranks on the power and electrocutes her. She gets shocked a bunch and then blows up. The possessed people vanish when this happens, which is weird because I thought like they were their own bodies. So if they vanish, does that mean there's just no bodies in this house anymore? In which case, they're in the clear. They can just walk out of it. Anyway, Liz gets kind of narky because, you know, her ancestor just got murdered again. But then Jennifer chooses to reveal a, an interesting tidbit of information. When she squares up to Elizabeth, she says, Don't you know who I am? I am the descendant of the child that Lilith didn't get to sacrifice. I don't know why, if Jennifer knew this, she didn't just tell Jack when they read it in the book. Because it made it look like Jennifer had something to hide. But she didn't. She could have just said, oh my god, and I'm here too because of this thing. It wasn't something she needed to keep secret. They already knew this story. They'd been told it earlier. It was just there to further influence the plot. It was just held back for plot reasons. Anywho, she then stabs Elizabeth and Elizabeth dies. Jennifer and Jack then exit the house hand in hand. And he's like, what are we going to do? Because there's a house full of the corpses of our friends and... How are we going to explain that to the cops? Which seems quite a pressing concern. But then Jennifer's like, I think we could put the past to rest now, finally. The past that they didn't know about until this evening. Because this was all brand new information for everyone but Jennifer. But apparently, 
in this ending, it, it, there's this idea that it's been bothering Jack for ages, that for some reason he knew this somehow and it was something he needed to put behind him. Makes no sense. But they smooch and then the movie's over. So, the end, I guess. So, like I said, I enjoyed this one a lot less than the third one, which I have previously reviewed. I think it's mostly due to Janet and also the fact that I had seen films that had this plot already, like The House on Haunted Hill. So it wasn't necessarily as interesting or unpredictable as the third one, which at least had elements that I hadn't seen coming. So that's unfortunate. I am going to review the second one in the series. Um, I think it's Witch House 2 Blood Coven. So that could be quite interesting. Um, and we did at least get some more of Lilith's backstory. And now we know that she is a witch and not just like a demon monster uh, as she was presented in the third film. So that's pretty interesting. As for the rest of the film, it was a little bit slow, which, considering it only has a runtime of 74 minutes or something, is a bit ridiculous. But it feels like it takes a long time to get going, and a lot of the scenes are just pointless banter between characters who are going to die anyway. So if it's not entertaining banter, it just kind of falls flat and slows the movie down. So it wasn't the best I've ever seen. And it didn't have as much witchy content as the third one, which had like rituals and stuff. This really just has like the one invocation. That's basically it. So if you're going to watch one of the movies in the series, I'd say for witchy content, watch the third one. Bearing in mind, I haven't seen the second one yet, so this ruling could change. But the third one did have that massive issue where, you know, they didn't really address some of the things that they brought up and some of the scenes they put into it. So... Swings and roundabouts, really. Let's see how good the second one is. I hope you've enjoyed this review. If you've got any other films you'd like to recommend to me, drop it into the comments on the YouTube section, comment on Twitter or on Instagram at WitchFix, or get in touch by email, which I do sometimes check, but not very often. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye!